It's June 15, 1904. And on the East River, just a short distance from Lower Manhattan, 1,300 people are fighting for their lives. Because the steamboat they've been riding, the General Slocum, has just caught fire. One of the many mothers on board, Elizabeth Kersher, was desperate to save her daughter Elsie from the flames. She did not know how to swim, so they put a life preserver on her, and as eyewitnesses said later, she sank as though a stone were tied to her. Accounts like that were very, very common in the aftermath. People dutifully put life preservers on themselves, on their children, and then jumped in the water, and they never resurfaced. When the Slocum burned and sank in the East River, more than a 1,000 people died. It remained the single greatest disaster in New York's history until the attacks on September 11th, a century later. But things may have gone very differently that day. The river was busy and full of other boats that could have helped anybody who jumped overboard and was able to stay afloat. So how did it all go so terribly wrong? And why are we talking about this now? It all comes down to trust and the critical business practices that keep it afloat. I'm Shaleen Gupta, and this is Trustonomy, an original podcast from OneTrust. As an author and journalist, I've spent years learning how top CEOs and managers build great companies. I co-authored a book about them, and along the way, there's one story that rang out louder than the rest. It's the story of trust. Trust is a superpower. Leaders who nurture it unleash innovation and creative problem solving. They create loyalty with customers, clients, and employees. Trust is directly connected to growth. Here on Trustonomy, each episode will start in the past with a story about broken trust that will make you rethink how you do business today, help you build and strengthen trust, and teach you how to repair it if it's been damaged. We'll talk to experts about issues like privacy, organizational culture, and data management, and examine how each can impact trust. I mean, trust is that fickle beast of, you know, it takes years to gain it and an instant to break it. And that's always going to be the case. This is Matt Moog. He's the expert who's going to help us figure out what a fire on a steamboat can teach us about assessing risk and how the suppliers you do business with can sink your company. We'll hear more from Matt later. But first, we need to find out exactly what happened on the General Slocum. It all begins with a large group of German-American immigrants heading down to Manhattan's East 3rd Street Pier. It's a gorgeous day, one of those spectacular June days where it's warm and sunny, and the Slocum was there waiting for them at about 8.30 in the morning. That's historian Edward T. O'Donnell. He's the author of Ship Ablaze, the tragedy of the steamboat general Slocum. It's a very impressive ship. It's 300 plus feet in length. It's got a great big paddle wheel. It's shimmering white. It was really the most impressive boat in all of the New York waterways. There were more than 1,300 passengers boarding the Slocum that day. They had chartered this grand, steam-powered paddle wheeler to take them to Long Island for their annual church picnic. They were all dressed in their Sunday finery, but people were also carrying picnic baskets and blankets, and they're really full of excitement because this is the 17th annual version of this, so people know this is generally a pretty awesome day. In 1904, the General Slocum is 13 years old, and it's run by the Knickerbocker Steamboat Company. We heard earlier about Elizabeth Kersher as she tried to save her daughter. But she was just one of hundreds of parents on the Slocum. Ed's research delved deeply into one family in particular, a husband and wife with three small children, the Liebenaus. The Liebenaus and their in-laws rush right up to the top deck because that, you know, for them, that seems like the best place where you get a nice view and it's, you know, you're out in the open. Other boats in the harbor toot their horns in recognition. A band plays the most popular German and American tunes of the day. Families are buying beer and pulling food from their picnic baskets. Passengers feel at ease, and they have good reason to. The General Slocum was an impressive vessel, and its captain, William H. Van Shake, had been piloting boats for 50 years. 
He had gotten a gold medal from some Siemens organization the year before for his you know, exemplary uh, safety record. And uh, the captain was highly regarded as one of the most experienced, trustworthy, safety conscious captains in those waterways. By nine that morning, the ship casts off and begins chugging up the East River. On board, the party's already begun. That fun and merriment lasts for all of 12 minutes. And then... A crew member is informed by a young boy that there's smoke coming up a stairwell. And he goes to check it out and finds that smoke is coming out of a storage area. None of these folks have been trained in any kind of fire safety, so he just yanks open the door. The flames that are smoldering in some hay that has been used as packing material goes from smoldering to turning into actual open flame. And, you know, the deckhand tries to whap the fire out with a piece of tarpaulin. And then he just runs, and he runs off to get some help. But he leaves the door open. And so the fire quickly engages everything else, and the room is full of flammables. It's called the lamp room, so it literally has lamp oil, oily rags, all that stuff. The deckhand and the first mate run for the fire hose, but the hose is old and rotting. It ruptures in their hands. And they, again, because they're untrained, they just drop the hose and run. And so the fire spreads with astonishing speed up that stairwell and then in every direction, so that by the time the captain is informed, just a few minutes later, the ship is really very seriously compromised. There's a great big fire, and it's spreading everywhere. Moments later, the passengers see smoke, big black coils of smoke. Cries of fire, fire, start to carry across the ship. People just lost their minds. You know, this is the most terrifying thing that anybody can imagine. Nobody knows how to swim. We're on a boat in the middle of the East River, and the boat is on fire, and the fire is raging in our direction. I want to pause a moment on a crucial point Ed just made. Nobody knows how to swim. Keep in mind, public pools and swimming lessons were still uncommon in 1904. People didn't teach their children how to swim. So imagine the anxiety that's gripping Mr. and Mrs. Liebenau. Paul, the father, heads into the panicked crowds searching for the kids. Meanwhile, all around him, people are falling overboard in the chaos. There were many people who kind of got on the other side of the railing and kind of hung on, only to be swept overboard by, you know, groups of 20 and 30 people just rushing away from a burst of flame right through a railing, right into the East River, carrying everybody with them. The floors begin to collapse, and so with one great thunderous sound, the decks collapse in on each other, taking with it scores and scores of people. People on shore and on boats are watching this unfold, and they later tell journalists, so we have these vivid accounts of a great big ball of fire pouring out of the port side of the vessel and then eventually moving its way all the way to the back. The fire is already a catastrophe, but the size of that catastrophe is about to balloon. And that's because of mistakes that were made months, even years, earlier. So boats of this size were required to have lifeboats, but these Lifeboats, somebody on the Slocum at some point decided just to wire them in place so that they wouldn't rock back and forth. They were basically affixed to the deck of the ship, and none of them were able to get into the water. There's one hope left, one way to survive. If they could jump overboard and stay afloat long enough, one of the boats in the East River might save them. After all, it was a very busy waterway. Help would be there soon. But again, very few people on board can swim. So everything now depends on the life preservers. Everywhere the life preservers were found, you found clusters of people. And so that's where Paul Liebenau found himself. At the turn of the 20th century, life jackets were filled with cork. That's how they floated. So imagine Paul Liebenau's terror when he notices that the cork is spilling out of the life preservers. The canvas covers are falling apart, and the cork itself seems to be crumbling. Regardless, Paul Liebenau grabs two life preservers for his family. Everybody on board is strapping these crumbling life preservers to their children and then lowering them, praying over the side of the vessel. Hoping that 
you know, one of these boats that's trailing will pick them up. It turned out that many of these life preservers simply were, you know, almost like sacks of dirt. They, the cork had dissolved and broken up, it lost all its buoyancy, and so instead of having a life preserver, you had a vest full of a substance that would absorb water and pull you down. The water around the Slocum was filled with cork dust, and the people actually choked on it. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Every second, more passengers are dying. In the end, more than 1,000 people perish, nearly everyone on board. Each family was affected differently. Some people lost a single family member. Some families lost, you know, more than 10. When the funerals began a few days later, thousands of New Yorkers went down to the Lower East Side and just stood there quietly, dropping flowers in front of these horse-drawn hearses, many of which were carrying children. So there's a real outpouring of emotional support and, you know, witness that takes place to this tragedy in its aftermath. Among the dead were Paul Liebenau's two elder daughters. Miraculously, though, he, his wife, and his six-month-old baby, Adela, survive. So his daughter was the youngest survivor. She lived to be 99 years old. When Ed started working on his book about the Slocum, Adela was still alive. She told Ed about her family's tragedy and showed him her father's scrapbook full of press clippings he had collected about the fire. And she said to me in her wonderful way, I think it was his therapy. And he cut out articles about new safety standards for these life preservers and for fire hoses. So he really kept kind of an eye on the, on the broader story as well. Look through these old reports, and this much is clear. A lot of things went wrong on that sunny June day in 1904. The crew was untrained, the lifeboats couldn't be launched, and it turns out even the inspector from the steamship inspection service who checked out the boat just a few weeks prior missed all the warning signs. They were sent out to make these inspections, almost all of which were perfunctory, were just cursory looks at things. They would quickly walk around the boat, they'd check a few boxes on a form, and then be on their way. And you would be cleared to operate your vessel for the year. The form that he filled out that said, you know, condition of life preservers, condition of fire hoses, you know, all of these things. And everything he's just signed off on as an in good condition, in fine working order. Nobody saw the danger. Why? Well, because nobody was really looking for it. And there was one thing that transformed this disaster into an unparalleled calamity. The company that supplied those faulty life preservers to the Knickerbocker. Here's Ed reading from the coroner's report. The coroner, he said, I found today more life preservers, or life killers rather, with rotten canvas coverings split and rotten granulated cork half dribbled out of the place where good, honest, solid cork ought to have been. I found several life preservers that had been removed from bodies dragged from the bottom of the river. These were waterlogged. And who was that vendor? Their name comes right out of a Dickensian title for their company, Conweiler's Never Sink Life Preservers. The Conweiler company had guaranteed their life preservers for 20 years. The life preservers on board the Slocum were only 13 years old. So why did they fail so dramatically? Conweiler and Sons had sourced their cork from another company, Nonpareil Corkworks. And Nonpareil was cutting corners in the worst way possible. Well, the Conweiler company thought it was buying, you know, let's say six pounds of cork, uh, when in fact it was much less cork, fraudulently weighed down by iron. And this was the kind of, you know, corner cutting, scamming that was very common in almost every realm of business in the late 19th and early 20th century and that regulatory agencies are just beginning to grapple with. If the Knickerbocker Company had done their due diligence and sourced functional life preservers, this story would have had a very different ending. Had people had access to functioning life preservers, even if they didn't put them on properly, probably could have stayed afloat, you know, two, three, four, five minutes. Many of them would have had a much greater chance of, of being saved so really, the life preservers are at the center of much of you know, the death toll that occurs. So what happened to the Knickerbocker Company in the aftermath of the fire? What responsibility did they bear? Captain William H. Van Shake was sent to prison, and several directors of the Knickerbocker Company were indicted but escaped conviction. The company itself 
dodged hefty legal penalties, but they couldn't escape punishment in the court of public opinion. Knickerbocker lost the trust of New Yorkers. Their reputation went down in flames. Just a few days after the Slocum tragedy, another one of their ships, the Grand Republic, was booked for a big trip. And, you know, given the reputation of well, the news that had come out about the General Slocum's condition and its lack of safety standards, untrained crew, a lot of people decided not to come. And so only about 25 percent of ticket holders showed up that day. The Knickerbocker Steamboat Company directors realized that they were, you know, in a lot of trouble. So they, they realized that the safest thing from their, you know, saving their own skin perspective was to sell the assets and walk away. The Slocum disaster caused an irreparable breach of trust. The Knickerbocker Company never recovered and was ultimately dissolved. It's a crazy story. I've never heard it before, especially since I spent the last 20 years in New York. I was just shocked to hear that it happened, and we don't still talk about it. I mean, I think it's a really valuable story. That's Matt Moog, general manager of third-party risk at OneTrust. Matt's work is all about assessing relationships with outside vendors, contractors, and partners. It's his job to identify weaknesses in a company's supply chain to help reduce risk. Oh, I, I can't think of a single industry that wouldn't benefit from understanding risk better. For Matt, the Slocum tragedy is an old but powerful example of a common misunderstanding about third-party risk that still exists today. Your customer doesn't know or care about the other companies behind the scenes. I'm sure there's not a single person that got on the Knickerbocker Steamboat Company's General Slocum and said, hey, I know who's actually providing the cork in these life vests, and I know who's providing the life vests themselves. I doubt anyone knew Comweiler and Sons until after the incident happened, then they probably didn't care too much about Conweiler and Sons. They cared more about the Knickerbocker Steamboat Company because that was the company that was leading the boat. So therein lies the need to make sure that you're not just managing risk, but managing who you choose to do business with. There's no way to completely avoid risk, but it helps if you allocate your resources to the most risky part of the business. Matt finds that most organizations spend 30 to 40 times more on managing internal risks when the external third or fourth or fifth party risks are much more dangerous. We see a lot of organizations who don't really take the time to trace the data to another party, don't take the time to trace a dependency to another party. And then you have a failure by that fourth party or sometimes fifth party, and that ripples up through the chain, and then you end up with an impact to your customer. So kind of understanding that evolution of impact both from a data perspective, a resiliency perspective, and just a core product standpoint, sometimes opens people's eyes to where risk may exist that they weren't aware of before. For the Knickerbocker Company, those third-party risks were as high as they come. But regardless of the level of risk you face in your business, Matt says you'll be much more successful if you don't confuse compliance or simply following the rules with true risk management. I see compliance as going through the motions of what needs to be done, what's expected to be done. I think when you're in a compliance mindset, you're just focused on getting your job done. You're typically doing it with blinders. You don't really care about anything else around you. You're making sure that that you've checked each box. It's a black and white type of an activity. Remember the inspection officer who examined the General Slocum before its departure? That was a big red flag. The inspector, and by extension, the Knickerbocker Company, was treating third-party risk management as a compliance issue. They didn't really think about mitigating risks for themselves or their customers in a proactive way. Compliance would tell you to have a, a life vest for each person. Compliance would tell you that life vests would need to be clearly marked. Compliance would tell you that life vests need to be located at certain portions of the boat and distributed throughout the boat. But real risk management isn't black and white. It's a gray area that requires a healthy dose of skepticism. We always ask ourselves in risk management, what could happen? So in the Slocum story specifically, risk management would tell you these life vests are 13 years old. Risk management would tell you, I threw a life vest in the water and it disintegrated. Unless you actually pressure test what's expected, you're never going to find if it works or not. And you don't want to find out something's not working during an emergency. You want to have that happen in a controlled situation. And I guarantee if they said, hey, five people, you need to go find your nearest life vest, put them in the water and make sure they float. And you got to do that every month or three months or six months or whatever. That's kind of how you talk about risk management over time. 
is making sure that you've kind of lived through the scenario. Plus, a real risk management approach would have uncovered not just the life preserver's failure, but the dysfunctional hoses, the lack of fire training for the staff, the badly stored flammable materials, and the inaccessible lifeboats. Real risk management would have changed everything. You know, I don't know how many times that inspector may have inspected that boat, but you do that 10, 20, 30, 40 times, it becomes kind of routine and, and you don't really take the time to objectively look at something new. When risk assessment becomes routine, you might miss important details. It can take a fresh perspective to see the entire picture. Nevertheless, you can't avoid risk completely. But it's important to know which risks are worth taking. Not only understanding what could go wrong, but what are my trade-offs? You know, am I paying a little bit more for higher quality? What's the risk relative to, you know, fire in the boat? Should I be doing other things? Risk management requires you to ask those additional questions and to go down those additional paths to make sure that whatever decision you're making with the context of risk is the right decision for the company overarchingly. Of course, third-party risk management means more than just throwing a life preserver in the water. We have more tools to understand what trade-offs are worthwhile. We can research our vendors and see what kind of history they have. We can ask for referrals and look into their finances, especially if they are new relationships or providing new services. Third-party risk management has an element of detective work to it when done well. It's not just the services that are directly being provided, but it's the overall company itself. If it's a company that's going to grow with you, understanding if they're financially viable, maybe they went for um, a recent debt round of funding, then there's the potential that they're cutting corners. They may be cutting their own costs. It's also important to talk with other companies that have already used your prospective vendor. Did they have any issues with the vendor's product or service? With Conweiler & Sons, that background research might have revealed that their life preservers were less trustworthy than promised. I think many people looked at it and said, well, there's a 20-year guarantee on it, so it's going to work. Well, 20-year guarantee isn't, isn't really that good when they just you know, put the number 20 on a box and really didn't have anything to back it up with. So it's hard to stand by a guarantee like that if there's not a track record or a history of saying exactly when these things start to fail. It's all about verifying on your customer's behalf rather than blindly trusting. You're doing that verification work so your customer can develop a bond, a lasting trust in everything you do. If I had to guess, the Knickerbocker Steamboat Company may have been more concerned with cost. So they may have said, you know, whoever I can get the most amount from in the shortest period of time for the least amount of cost, you know, that's going to be good business. Well, it may be good business, but it's not good risk management. And I think there's a balance there to be had between what's good business and what's good risk management. Learning to build risk management, especially third-party risk management, into our idea of good business has been a long time coming. In the 19th century, a trust economy starts to emerge as people's lives and businesses start to become more interconnected. Whether it's riding a steamboat or flying on a 737 airliner, so much of what we do is predicated on trust. And when you break that trust, like the Knickerbocker Company did, you won't be able to blame your third-party vendors. We've seen significant issues where customer harm has been done or a breach has occurred. And the regulators do not allow you to pass those fines on to third parties. They make you absorb those holistically. You can't push that out to someone else and say, well, that was their fault. And if the damage is severe... It can destroy your entire brand. It could mean fines from a regulatory perspective. It could mean class action lawsuits from a customer perspective. It could mean bankruptcy. It could impact dis distributors. It could, it could impact stores. It could impact brokers and agents. What you do with your company and your decision, especially with respect to customer trust, that ripples through every aspect of the, the organization and how it operates. But at the end of the day, losing trust is always about more than a fine. It's about more than losing customers, too. It's about the integrity of your business and your brand in the long term. And once it's damaged, well... You have to earn that trust again. And that might not be a PR event that happens over the course of two weeks. That may be 10 years of repairing trust with your customers. And there's still no guarantee at the end of that that you're going to regain their trust. It's an unfortunate reality that sometimes things go terribly wrong before they get better. The Knickerbocker Steamboat Company made fatal risk and trust decisions back in 1904. And while it's cold comfort for the families of those who drowned, the disaster did lead to new regulations for steamboats. 
Lots of recommendations come forward and many of them are adopted. Things like putting sprinklers throughout a, a vessel, creating the ratio of one life preserver to each passenger, and then creating standards for those life preservers uh, themselves. So there are a lot of positive things come out of the tragedy. They don't offset the tragedy, but the uh, measures that are taken, many of them are quite meaningful and to this very day are saving lives. Today, over a century later, the world has become more complicated and more connected, with technology playing a greater role in our lives. The way we assess risk has certainly improved, but to truly create safety and trust, we have to get past that compliance mindset Matt mentioned and investigate risk beyond some simple checklist. We also have to research vendors and all third parties in a meaningful way. And of course, we have to keep in mind those large financial and legal stakes that should inspire anyone to take third-party risk management seriously. When we use third parties, sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking, hey, someone else is handling that. But in the end, it's your responsibility. Because consequences are immediate and real to your customers. That's how real and important trust can be. Till next time, I'm Shaleen Gupta, and this is Trustonomy, an original podcast from OneTrust. Trust.